لمحمد خير الشبائل وكامل وهي الدلال بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين حبيبنا الشفينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من السن يفقه قولي وبعض السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome once more to our Sira class The last thing we spoke about was In fact we started to speak about the Ahl Sufa The people who would used to live in this area Where the Messenger of Allah had built Just behind Al-Masjid al-Nabawi And he built this to accommodate the people who were from amongst the Muhajir who came from Mecca and uh, this place it hosted them for them to sleep and then the Prophet Sallallahu he used to pair them off with some of the Ansar <clears throat> amongst them we had spoken about was Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala and and we had also stated that uh, Abu Hurairah was the person who narrated the most narration amongst the Sahabas. Whilst the uh, Muhajir and the Ansar, they were busy in their trade, he committed himself to studying the narrations of the Prophet wasallam, <clears throat> memorizing them. And he said that I used to split the night. He said I used to split the night into three parts. One part I would sleep. The other part I will pray, and the third part I used to review those narrations of, you know, which I had learned from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So how did the people of the Sufa, how did the Ahl Sufa lived? I mean, they had to eat, they had to have some means of livelihood. One source of livelihood was the sadaqah which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he used to receive and he would give it to them. And sometimes when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will receive a gift, he will take a part of it and then he will give it to them. So a lot of time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will receive some animals as sadaqah. Sometimes a person will give him an animal as a gift or some animals as a gift. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ, he will receive uh, clothing. Remember these people who are migrating from Makkah, they could not take everything they possessed in Makkah because they, they, when they were fleeing, they had to do it, you know, uh, undercover. They couldn't take everything. They had to make it look like they were probably they were still living in Makkah. So in case someone would pass, they would say, well, oh yeah, you know, he's home, he's resting. You know, by the time they will be, you know, way on the outskirts of Makkah, heading towards Medina. So they had to cover their grounds properly. So they couldn't take everything. Their wallet didn't have paper currency. They had coin currency, gold coin, the dinar and the dirham. So even though they were wealthy, I mean, can you imagine a man toting 5,000 dinars on his back? And a dinar is a gold coin. So it's weighty. I mean, if the enemies are chasing you, how fast can you run with this weight? The animal will become restless and tired, and you yourself will become restless and tired. So sometimes they would hide their wealth, and sometimes they didn't have a choice but to you know, just give away their wealth. Because what's the use of hiding it, and you can't use it? So the Prophet ﷺ will receive some sadaqah, he will give it to them. Sometimes he receives gifts, and he will give it to them. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he used to encourage the people from amongst the Ansar to invite the Muhajir over. He would encourage them, and one example of that is one of the Ansar, Ya'ish al Ghifari, and he said, My father was from amongst the people of As Sufa. And the Prophet ﷺ, he ordered the Sahabas, the people of the Ansar, to invite the people of As Sufa in their homes. So they will invite them and give them a meal. So they will come and some of the Sahabas took some away. They, come, they came to uh, the Sufa, the area where the people used to stay. 
And they took some of them away. And he said, until only five of us remain. I mean, imagine everyone is coming and taking someone and five people remain and there was no one to take them to their homes. So what happened? It, it, I mean, it, look, it looks bad. Isn't that so? He said, then the Prophet wasallam he said to us, all of you go with me to my house. So probably that worked out for the best. The Prophet wasallam he took the remaining five to his home and he said, uh, Yaish al-Ghifari said, the Messenger of Allah wasallam fed us. So, I mean, it worked out for the best that they ended up in the home of the Messenger of Allah and they ate from the Messenger of Allah's home. In another rewind, the Prophet he says, whoever have food enough for two people should take a third with him and whosoever have enough food for four people, he should take a fifth or he should take a sixth with him. So sacrifice and generosity, it was a part of Islam even from the very early stages on, from day one, it wasn't something that came in. You know, revelation came to be generous and revelation came to be sacrificing towards your Muslim brother. It wasn't like that. And this was something that was unique amongst the Arabs. Even though they were pagans, even though they were idol worshippers, even though they did not believe in Muhammad, one quality that the Arabs had that the Romans and the Persians did not possess was generosity. This was something that uh, these other people, this is what made them outstanding. It's something that the other people that was uh, the superpowers didn't have. I mean, they will take you for anything. But the Arabs, even though they were living this primitive life, even though they were living this nomadic life, they still were generous people. Even though they had a little for themselves, they will give it. So generosity and sacrifice, it was something from day one amongst the Muslims, amongst the Arabs. Allah has revealed verses of Quran with respect to taking care of the orphan, taking care of the needy, to be generous towards the guests. All these were acts of ibadah. So being generous is an act of ibadah. Being kind, being civil, is, they are acts of ibadah. Sacrificing is an act of ibadah towards other people, not only Muslims, eh? not only Muslims, towards people in general. I mean, if Allah can reward you for even taking care of a dog, or feeding a dog, how much more will he reward you for giving some food to a non-Muslim? And this is something that we need to do. Not only the Muslims we should assist or help, you know, someone may come to your home and beg for something. You know, Allah Rabbil he will, he will give you opportunities to gain rewards. Well, Allah will give you so much opportunities to gain rewards that sometimes you don't know it's an opportunity, but He will send someone to your home. A poor man, begging. He may not be a Muslim. Asking for something to eat. Not necessarily money, but He just wants something to eat. So He gives you an opportunity to gain some rewards. So even to the non-Muslims, we ought to be generous and kind. We have to be civil, giving and caring towards them. So we should not think that being a Muslim does not demand some sacrifice from us. I mean, this is not a free ride. It demands you to be generous and sacrificing. So if you want Jannah, if we seek to please Allah, then we have to sacrifice for Allah and His religion. We have to be generous and kind towards people. Because being generous was a part of this religion of Allah from day one. I mean, it wasn't something that only came in when Nabuat was bestowed upon the Prophet ﷺ. This wasn't the case. It was there from the, 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 the very beginning. The Prophet ﷺ, he is saying to the Sahabas that if you have food for two people, then invite a third. If you have food for three people, then invite a fourth person, or invite a fifth person, or invite, invite a, sixth, uh, a sixth person. This is something very, very important in Islam. Do you know during Ramadan, there are some homes that, Muslim homes, by the way, 
that sometimes don't have food? During Ramadan, during Ramadan there are homes, Muslim homes, where they, I mean, they hardly have anything to eat. And if you meet them in a masjid, if you meet these people in a masjid, they will smile at you. And I mean, alhamdulillah, everything is okay. There are many Muslim homes that sometimes they wake up in the morning and, you know, they have very little to eat for uh, sahri. When it's time to break fast, uh, they have very little to eat uh, for iftar and they are ashamed to ask someone. They are ashamed to ask someone. Part of being in the Muslim community is that, you know, we need to seek out these people. We need to seek out these people seriously we need to go and search and find out the poor muslims among amongst the, the people in the community and in ramadan especially of course i mean you do not uh, there is there are no seasons for good deeds we should not think that there is a season for good and there is a season for not doing good we must do good all the time be generous all the time not only in ramadan but especially in ramadan you know, we seek out these poor Muslims who sometimes, not only in your community, many people think that, well, it's a community thing. There are many Muslims all over Trinidad who, you know, they are struggling to make ends meet at the end of the day. They are hard up, they don't have, the fathers don't have a job, and things aren't getting easy. So the Prophet wasallam, he was telling the Sahabas that if you have food for three people, then invite a fourth person. So he's teaching the Sahabas to invite people. He's teaching the Sahabas to invite people to their homes even though they had enough food for just two or three people. And the Prophet wasallam, he would take care of them even though others would come to, to, uh, to them for his needs, for their needs. I mean, look at an example, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala. She used to be doing all the work in the house. In the house. And her clothing used to become blackened. I mean, they didn't have console stove or some whirlpool, you know, eight burner stoves and nice, you know, uh, baking utensils and, you know, they had gas and all these things. They had to use firewood. And sometimes, you know, the fire, it, when it blazes, it causes this blackness on the pot. And her hands would, was becoming, you know, rough and she was becoming very very tired and her clothing used to be black and her hands used to get this black stain and it's something hard to come out so she she complained to her husband ali ibn abi talib radiallahu ta'ala and he said to her that you know your father received some slaves some servants why don't you ask him for one so she goes to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and she said oh my father this is my condition so what did he say to her he said, in the name of Allah. He said, I'm not going to give you and leave the people of a sufa I'm not going to give you a slave whilst the people are hungry in, from amongst the people of Ahl sufa I'm going to take these slaves and sell them so that I, the money which I get, I'm going to look after the needs of these people and this is where he mentioned to her that to recite the tasbih and this is, became famous you know uh, tasbih fatima uh, subhanallah 33 times uh, alhamdulillah 33 times and allahu akbar 34 times so he did not give his own daughter i mean who was really you know in, in a state he didn't give her a slave because he cared for the people of Asufa so much that he took it upon himself to look after their need. And this is the quality of a true leader. This is one of the qualities of a true leader. He looks after those people who are under him, takes care of their need, look for means and ways of looking after their needs. It's one of the qualities of a true leader. So it shows us how much care the Prophet ﷺ he had for Ahl Sufa. Now the people should not think that the people of Ahl Sufa, they used to take advantage of the people's kindness. That they would exploit the, people's, the people of Medina. You know, free food and free lodging and free everything. No. 
These people were very active people. They were very active in da'wah. They were very active in ibadah. And they were devoted people to the religion of Allah. I mean, these were students of knowledge. These were the scholars who graduated from the first uh, university, the uh, Masjid al Nabawi. These were the first graduates. These were the true Mujahideen who later became Shuhada, ma martyrs. For example, from amongst the scholars who graduated from the ranks of Ahl Sufa was Abu Huraira. He was the most prolific narrator of hadith of the Prophet. Another member of Ahl Sufa was Hudayfa bin Yaman, and he was the expert in the hadith of Al Fitan. The, uh, many of the hadiths of Al Fitan, the trials and the tribulation of the ending of time. Hudayfa bin Yaman ta'ala, is the one who narrated most of these. So he was an expert in this narration. Then we can speak about a shahada from amongst the people of As-Sufa. A lot of them died in the Battle of Badr. Then you have uh, Hanzala, who died in the Battle of Uhud. Hanzala was the one whom the Malaika, the angels, they washed his body. And then you had some of those who became martyrs in the Battle of Khaybar. Then you had some of them died in the Battle of Tabuk. Then you had some of them who died in the Battle of Hudaybiyah or the Battle of and the Battle of Yamama. So they won't, I mean, they, they wasn't exploiting the people of Medina. They were involved. They were involved in things. People who could not think that people couldn't do, they will do it. Also, they tried to make a living. What they used to do, Alama Zawak Shari, he says that they used to collect the date seed. Because, I mean, date was a famous thing. They had the date market. Up to this day, they have the date market in Medina. And dates is, I mean, it's a big thing in Makkah and Medina. Anyone who goes for Hajj, they bring back dates. And you get dates, I mean, all over you will find dates selling. So it was a big thing. They used to collect the date seed, crush it, and sell it as... Uh, animal feed. So they tried to make, they tried to make a living, but uh, of course the conditions were very tough. It wasn't easy for them. The number of Ahl Sufa it fluctuated, depending on the condition, but there were average of about uh, around seventy people who were from amongst Ahl Sufa. And they used to live, about this, this 70, this average 70 used to live full time in that area where the Prophet Sallallahu had built for them. And they were active in studying and, you know, other things, acts of ibadah and so on. One thing that we can learn from this incident or this small brief uh, explanation on the Ahl Sufa was that it teaches us a very, very important thing about having a welfare service in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ was looking after their needs. He was the leader. Here it is, you have so many people who accepted him as the messenger of Allah, who accepted his religion. They left their homes. They didn't have anything. And they migrated only for Allah and his messenger, only for the cause of religion. The Prophet ﷺ, he couldn't just... Let these people just, you know, just, they migrated to Medina now and they have nothing. So it teaches us about having a welfare system in Islam. And this is also a part of our dawah. It is also a part of our dawah. Ubaidah bin Samit radiallahu ta'ala, and he says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would become busy, so he would turn over the new Muslims to us. Because he had a lot of things to do. So what he did is that whoever newly entered Medina, he would turn them over to us. If a new immigrant would come to the Prophet ﷺ, a new Muslim entered the fall of Islam and comes into Medina, if he comes to the Prophet ﷺ and the Messenger of Allah ﷺ was busy, 
then he would send one or two of them over to us. You know, to do what? To teach them Quran. So it was not only about feeding them. Now listen carefully what Ubaidah bin Samit radiallahu ta'ala and he said. To teach them Quran. There are many people today who rattles off hadith. Quick to quote hadith. Ask them to read Quran. And some of them, their Quran is in the most deplorable of states. So people are quick to quote hadith today. Everything is hadith. Hadith, hadith, hadith. Can you recite some verses of Quran? Well, you know, um, <clears throat> well, I'm trying to learn Quran. By the way, they are quoting hadith in Arabic for you. And this is the trend in society, what society has become. Everyone, if you don't know two or three or even 10 or 15 hadith, then something is wrong to you. You, are, you cannot even recite Quran and you are quoting hadith. But by Summit, he says, when the Messenger of Allah will turn them over to us, he will instruct us to teach them Quran, first and foremost. When Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala used to send off people to, when, you know, when Islam, Islam had started to enter different states, and the people used to require a teacher, whenever he used to send off people into these new Islamic states, you know what he used to say to the, the delegation or the person who he was sending? Teach the people Quran. Do not teach them hadith, lest they mix up the two and they think that hadith is Quran. First, you instruct the people with Quran, and only if they ask you about hadith, then. But the first thing you do is teach them Quran. First things first. What is the law of Allah in Quran? What, is Allah, what has Allah ordered us to do? Quran. So the Prophet. He said, Ubaidah bin Samit radiallahu ta'ala, and he said, he sent a man to me, and he stayed with me at my home, and I would feed him as a member of my own family, and I will teach him Quran. I would teach him Quran. So Dawah to them also included taking care of the needs of the Muslim to what they could have afforded to do. I mean, these people didn't have cushions and sofa and luxurious chairs and, you know, dining set and, you know, a, a conditioned room to relax in. And they didn't have these things. So whatever they could have afforded to sacrifice, they did it to their best ability. We used to feed them and we were instructed also to teach them Quran. So Dawah included these two things. Because some of them would make the hijrah to Medina and they leave everything, as I mentioned before. They left everything back at Makkah. Because, I mean, some of them were wealthy people. Suhail Rumi, who migrated, who was a wealthy person. But in order to migrate, he had to sacrifice something. Because the Makkans, the, the Quraysh, they were chasing him. And he said to them, listen, if I tell you where my wealth is, would you leave me alone? They said, yes. So he said, okay, my wealth is at such and such a place. So they turned around and went for his wealth and he migrated. So it's not that they just migrated. They had to sacrifice something. And most of the time they sacrificed their wealth. I mean, they worked hard for their money. Who takes up all their money today and give it to someone? Who does that? Only for the sake of Allah and his religion. Only for the sake... Because at that time, migration was incumbent upon them. At that time, making the hijrah was incumbent upon them. So at all cost, they sacrificed. They left their parents behind. They left their, sometimes they will leave their children behind who did not become Muslim. People of their relatives who did not become Muslims, they left everything. Do you know how difficult that is? To leave everything and migrate only for the sake of Allah and his religion. Only for the sake of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They made that migration. 
So they sacrificed for the sake of Allah and they came to Medina. Now it's the responsibility of the Muslims of Medina to take care of them. So Ubaidah bin Samit radiallahu ta'ala and he's saying that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sent this man over for me to teach him Quran. But I also used to take care of his social needs. And this is a very, very important aspect of Dawah. Sometimes we have very, very, very poor uh, people who from different background, backgrounds becoming Muslim. And sometimes we have, people have to give up their jobs. Sometimes people give up their jobs because their work, it's not conducive to Islam. Sometimes their work is not conducive. The, the money that they, they are paid from, it's from haram, har, some haram means. And now they become Muslim and they learn what is halal and haram and they give up that. They just leave that for the sake of Allah. So you have people like this. And when they become Muslim, they have nothing. They have nothing. Now it's the duty of the Muslims to be generous towards them. It's the duty upon, of the Muslims to take care of their needs. To help them towards their first step in becoming Muslim. Imagine they are becoming Muslim, leaving everything, coming into Islam, hoping that they will be aided in some way or the other, and everyone turns their back on them. So they will say to themselves, probably I should go back to my old ways. I didn't know, I thought Muslims were generous and kind and sacrificing, only to realize they come into this religion of Allah and People turn their backs on them. Mind you, there are many cases like this where Muslims are in dire need, whether it is to repair their homes or look after some medical needs or something like that. And they come to the masjid and the masjid turn their back. I'm sorry, we cannot assist you. This is a part of the looking after the social needs, a welfare service in Islam. And every masjid, should do something like that. I mean, imagine you become chronically ill. You are poor. You have some heart disease that you require surgery. And you can't afford to do the surgery. Because the surgery, you know, probably it goes over $100,000. I mean, how much money would throwing a barbecue bring in? Because you have to put it out to get. How much people are you going to ask? How much people will you be begging? Put yourself in that situation. Just put yourself in that situation and you will see what's it like. So someone comes to you and in some, you know, he... He needs to go and do a surgery. And the masjid cannot look after his need, that he's Muslim. Lo and behold, some Jehovah witness, they comes and they say, well, the church will provide for you. The Christian church comes. And this happens. Well, sister, don't worry. We'll repair your home for you. you, want their, you do you know what they want in return? All they want you to do is come to their church. And then you will see Sister Quraysha or... Uh, brother Farid or brother Ahmad is going to the church on a Sunday morning, he and his entire family. Whose fault is that? Then you know what we'll do? We'll point the finger. And then we will sit around a table and decide what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, what you were supposed to be doing, you didn't do. This incident teaches us about this system, a welfare system in Islam. The masjid is not, uh, the, the structure of the masjid should not only be a place where you come and perform your salah. It should be such a structure like that. Where it look after the need, it looks after the needs of the entire Muslim community, the poor and the needy amongst them. And this is how I was, and this is why we continue to fall as a society, as a nation, generally, we continue to go down. 
How many Muslims have apostated Islam? How many Muslims have left the fold of Islam and go over to Christianity? Well, you, you cannot accept Hinduism. You have to be born as a Hindu to be a Hindu. It's like a Jew. Judaism, you don't accept Judaism. You have to be born as a Jew to be a Jew. But Muslim, how many Muslims do you probably know one or two? I know one or two. The sister was telling me, you know, that the, the, she appealed to the masjid for help to build over her house. She had five children, four or five children. She said, my house was leaking. I mean, it used, the bed used to be wet. Where would my children sleep? My husband, he left us. The Christians came. After appealing and getting false and broken promises from the members of the Jamaat, then the Christians came and they built over a whole new house for me. I went to the sister and she said, this is the house. They built this house. They provided the money and they provided the, the, the work, the workers, the laborers. People from the church came and built my house. She said, the Muslim, they didn't help me not even with one cent. I mean, what can you tell a person like that? Who appeals over and over. And mind you, there are Muslims in every community who can more than afford to do something like that. I mean, just look at the vehicles that they drive. Sometimes they drive vehicles worth, I mean, $700,000. Now, nothing is wrong in owning something good. But at the same time, when an appeal is made to do something good, then don't, don't turn your backs on that. That is a Muslim brother. He'll be held accountable for that on the day of Qiyamah. Allah will ask you about that. Then such and such a person came. You didn't even care to take a look at their home. Whilst you were sleeping comfortable at night, their homes were leaking. They had to put a pot here and a pan there and a cup there, a basin on the other side. Restless. If a strong wind blew, they were frightened that their roofs will blow off whilst you slept comfortably. Is that being Muslim? You have many conditions like this. This incident of the Ahl Sufa, it teaches us a lot. It teaches us a lot. The care the Prophet used to take in looking after the needs of the people of a Sufa, we need to take a lesson from this. It's a very, very serious thing in Islam. Another very important thing was that the Prophet ﷺ, he wanted the Muslim society to become organized. Now, there are many Jamaats that are disorganized today. I mean, it's in a terrible state. And many people feel that, oh, well, where does this thing come from? We need to have one Amir in the Jamaat, and that's it. You know, doing the Sirah, you learn a lot. And one of the things that you learn is an organizational structure in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ, Islam is an organized religion. I mean, you can't think, have things helter-skelter, people doing as they want. You know, there are some people who say that, you know, look at look, a simple thing. A brother was telling me, you know, he said that this man walked into the masjid with his shoes on and performed salah. He said he was telling the brother, well, you're not supposed to do that. He said, but the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam performed salah in his shoes on. So I said, well, why don't you walk into Masjid al-Haram in Makkah with his shoes on? Why don't you walk into Masjid al-Nabawi and perform salah on the carpet with his shoes on? And see what happens to him. I mean, these are places where you should be practicing more sunnah. Why didn't you do that? You can't. They will throw you out. They will throw you. And if even you perform the salah with your shoes outside, people will rebuke you. I mean, even in the courtyard, everyone takes their shoes and slippers off. Everyone does it. And who can be practicing more sunnah than these people? Not even the Imam of Haruman Sharifain perform wears a shoes on or even a slipper on and perform salah. Not even that. So you must have some order. And then when people say things, they say, oh, you people, you are like this and you are like that and you are not Muslims. And 
A simple thing like that. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he appointed representatives over these groups. So you had groups, he grouped them off, and he will put someone in charge of a group. I mean, you can't have everyone knocking at the door of the Messenger of Allah every day. Well, oh, Messenger of Allah, you know, such and such is the case, and you know, I mean, 24-7 people might be like this. So he appointed representatives. Abu Hurairah was Arif. Arif is like, you know, a corporal. Someone who represented his people and he would know them. So he would express their needs towards the leader. So whatever complaints they have, they will uh, tell Abu Hurairah and he will take their needs he will have a meeting with the Prophet وسلم, and he will express the needs of the people. And this is a structure in Islam. You can't have everyone. I mean, imagine the Imam having every Tom the Carrier and Jackson knocking on his door morning, noon, and night. It's difficult. All right, lodge your complaint to brother so and so and write it in a piece of paper as if it's too long. And the brother, when you lodge your complaint, he will make a note of it and he will give me it when I come to office so I will look after it. So we need representatives. So Abu Hurairah he was the representative of Ahl Sufa. So if the Prophet وسلم, he had any instructions even to give the people of Ahl Sufa, or he wanted to hear their needs, this will occur through their representative Abu Hurairah And this shows us the organization of the Prophet وسلم, that he instilled within the jama'ah of the Muslims. So it's important for us to be organized as a Muslim community. It's important for us to be organized wherever we go. You are going on a trip. A few Muslims, they are going on a trip. For example, you are going for Hajj. And sometimes you have people doing their own thing. And many times you hear people become lost, isn't that so? When the leader says, hey, stick with the group. Don't go wandering off. And then you come back and you hear, well, you know, such and such person got, got lost. And this person got lost. And that person got lost. I mean, sometimes I wonder, how on earth can you get lost? I mean, it's not, you, something has to be wrong for you to become lost. I mean, you just can't get lost. <laughs> Look around. <laughs> but some people just wander off and do their own thing. Some people just go off and do their own thing that I'm going to do this. And next minute, you know, we can't find sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so. And you have now the entire jama, people from your group, busy looking for you whilst they could have been doing some ibadah. Why? Because you fail to follow instructions. Okay, don't go here. Don't go there. And sometimes the group leaders will say, you know what? You know, it's not safe going up to Ghari Hira. I mean, what if you slip and fall? Accidents could happen. What if you slip and fall and you become terribly injured? Whose responsibility is that? the group leader now. He has to run with you to this place and that place and run here and run there while he have to look after the needs of the other pilgrims. He have to look after you, busy with you. So it's important for us even in Jamaat, the Jamaat to follow the instructions. When instructions are given, you follow instructions because there is some wisdom behind what, what, you know, what's being said. So we spoke about the first project uh, in Medina, and that was building the masjid. So what's the other three projects that the Prophet Wasallam embarked on? Now he embarked on four projects. The first one was to build the masjid, and this is the first thing he did when he reached at Kuba, Masjid Kuba. When he reached at Kuba, he built, the first thing he did was to build a masjid. Notice what he did. He built a masjid, a place of worship. The first thing he did when he reached to Medina was to build a masjid, Masjid al-Nabawi. 
The second thing that he embarked upon was establishing a brotherhood between the Muhajir, the people of Mecca, and the people of, of Medina, the Ansar. Thirdly, it was to devise some means to form a treaty, a covenant, that would govern the people of Medina. Because in Medina you had the Arabs, and you had the Jews, and you had the pagans, and you had different people from different ethnic backgrounds. How can all these people coexist at the same time in Medina? So he had to form a covenant that would govern the people of Medina. So this was the third project the Prophet ﷺ embarked upon. And the fourth project he embarked upon was to establish the Muslim army. And when we reach that, you will see the importance of establishing the Muslim army. So these are the first four projects the Prophet ﷺ embarked upon when he entered Medina, when he migrated to Medina. So we already spoke about the masjid. The second project was the establishment of a brotherhood in Medina. Allah Rabbil Isa, he says in Quran, Allah says, and hold firmly to the rope of Allah. Jami'a, all together, wala tafarraku, and do not become divided. And do not become divided. I mean, today you see this ayah of Quran is openly being, being neglected. So you have people will run down the road and build their masjid. Why? Because I'm not seeing eye to eye with the imam. And then you will have another group running up the road and building the next masjid or renting a place and, well, I don't like what these people are doing there. But did the masjid do you anything? So if you're going into the haram, if you were to go into Makkah and you walk into the haram and you don't like what's going on there, why don't you go down the road and do something on your own? Do that. If you migrate and you say, well, I'm going to, you know, to England to live. I'm migrating to live in England. And you go to the masjid, well, I don't like what's going on here. Would you go down the road and establish a new masjid? So you wouldn't do it abroad, but you would do it in your own community. Why? So you take a handful of people and you run down the road. You take a handful of people and you run there. You take a handful of people and you run across and you keep constantly doing that. So you are constantly dividing the jamaat. This is one aspect of it. Allah Rabbil Azza continues in Quran and he says, He says, and remember the favor of Allah upon you when you were enemies in kuntum is kuntum a'da'a when you were enemies fa'allafa bayna kulubikum allah rabbal isa he says and allah is the one who brought your hearts together the muhajir from mecca and the ansar from medina allah says fa'allafa bayna kulubikum allah is the one who brought your hearts together fasbahtum bi ni'matihi ikhwana and allah is the one who bestowed his favors upon you and made you brothers. Allah is the one who did that. Allah says, وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَىٰ شَفَاهُ فَرَتِمْ مِنَ النَّارُ And you were on the edge of the pit of fire. فَانْقَذَكُمْ مِنْهَا And Allah is the one who saved you from that. Allah is the one who saved you from that. كَذَلِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَآيَاتِهِ لَعَلَكُمْ تَهْتَدُونَ Thus, does Allah make clear to you his verses that you may be guided. You were on the brink of entering the fire and Allah gave you iman. Allah is the one who placed love in your heart towards your other Muslim brothers. This is why in another verse of Quran, Allah says, وَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ Allah is the one and Allah is the one who brought your hearts together. Allah says, لَوْ أَنْفَقْتَ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا مَا أَلَّفْتَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ أَلَّفَ بَيْنَهُمْ Allah says, and if you, لَوْ أَنْفَقْتَ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا If you were to spend all that is on the face of the earth, 
if you were to spend everything that is on the face of the earth, ma alafta baina kulubikum, so that you could have brought these hearts together, so that you could have created love between these hearts, Allah says you would not be able to do that. You would not be able to do that. Allah says, "Wala kin Allah Allah fabeinahum." It is Allah, but it is Allah who brought these hearts together. Allah says, "Inna hu azizun hakim." Verily, Allah is exalted in might and wise. So, my dear respected Muslims, we may do things and say, "You see unity? Look unity." And you know what we do? We have a program. And we cook some food. And we invite people from all different parts, all different jamaat. And then you look at each other and say, well, you see, this is unity. No, people probably only come to eat your food. That's it. You cook some good food and people only came, came, came to eat your food. Sometimes a lot of people come late. <clears throat> a lot of people come late. You uh, make an announcement that there will be a lecture, half the people might come late. What do you think they're coming late to do? You think they were really busy? No. They thought that the program was already over and they were probably praying salah, so they came. They, little did they know that the program ran a little late because the lecturer spoke a little long. So they came and they said, well, all right, well, we are here already. Some of them are lying outside. Some of them are out by the road. And then call time for salah. They come in, they pray their salah afterwards, food is sharing. And some people even bad mouth the food. Oh, well, it's too salty, and I didn't like what they cooked, and I contributed to this meal, and this is what, this is what they will cook. And then people turn around and say, wow, look at people. You see unity? This is unity. People only came to eat your food. Face facts. People only came to eat your food. Allah Rabbil is saying that the love that you have between yourselves, it is not by your doing that love that is in your heart towards your Muslim brother or towards your Muslim sister, it is not by your doing, it is by Allah's doing. Allah is the one who placed that love in your hearts. So Allah Rabbil Isa, he tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that it is Allah who brought the hearts of the Muslim together. <coughs> and if you had spent all the wealth and you spent so much money behind programs, Thousands of dollars go into programs. Some people rent a hall and have to rent chairs and hire caterers and so on and so forth. So many things have to go, go into these programs. So much money is spent and then you say, yeah, look at Unity, wow. We should have this regularly. But today it's nice, tomorrow it's okay, but the third time it's too funny. I'm always spending and spending and I'm not seeing any profit. I'm only giving and giving. So Allah Rabbil is saying that if you were to spend all your wealth to unite the hearts of people, to put love and unity in the hearts of people, you wouldn't be able to do that. People will just come for a shoe and that's it. But true love, that love which is really needed, Allah is the one who puts that and that is a favor from Allah upon man. That is a great favor from Allah. To bring the hearts of Al-Muhajirin, Al-Ansar together. I mean people who never saw the other. Bringing their hearts together. Uniting them and making them one strong force. That is a favor from Allah. Allah Rabbil Anza, he says in Surah, Surah Hashra verse 9, he says, and those who were settled, had they had homes. <clears throat> now this ayah is speaking about the people of Medina. This ayah is speaking about the qualities of the Ansar. Allah Rabbi al -Azza, he says that those people who settled and had homes and adopted the faith before them that was in front of their face. The, the prophet, the uh, religion of the messenger of Allah. They loved those, listen to what Allah says. He says, they loved those, يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ حَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ They loved those who migrated towards them. Who, are, who is Allah speaking about? He's speaking about Muhajir. 
those who settled in Medina, and Medina was their hometown, that is their homes there. Those who migrated, the muhajir, Allah is saying, يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ They loved those who migrated towards them. وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً And they did not feel, they did not find in their hearts, they did not find in their breasts, any want. Meaning, they did not feel that their guests were overburdening, overburdening them. They did not feel that, oh, we have these people and we have to look after their needs. We have to cook for them, shelter them, clothe them, even give them money. Allah says that they did not feel this in their hearts. They did not feel it. They did not find any want in their breasts of what they were given. Another quality Allah says, but they gave them preference over themselves. Allah says they gave them preference over themselves. So the Ansar, they will give preference to the Muhajir, preference over their own selves. Allah says, وَمَنْ يُوكَ الشُّحَّ نَفْسِي فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِهُونَ Even though they were in pri privation, even though that the Ansar, they were in need also. Because these people didn't have much. These people didn't have much for themselves. But what they had, the little that they had, they provided for the for their brothers who migrated. Allah Rabbi Al Anza says, وَمَنْ يُقَ شَحَ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِهُونَ Allah says, and whoever is protected from stinginess of the soul. Now, there are different words for stinginess. There is a word like hirs. ha ra sod Hirs. And hirs means stinginess. It means greediness. Now don't go around calling people, you know, by this. Don't tell people that you have this quality of hirs in your heart. Ra, ra, ra. Don't do that. Then there is another word, bukhl, which also means stinginess and greed. But Allah doesn't use these two words. He says, He uses the word shuh. That is the worst type of stinginess. This is why Allah uses this. Shuh. Many of the scholars, they say it's the worst type of greediness. It's that type of stinginess where I mean, well, of course, you are stingy. But you are stingy to that extent where you are always wanting what your other brother or your sister have, and alongside that, you wish that they don't have it. You wish that it's taken away from them and they never get it back and it's given to you. This is shuh. I mean, you can be greedy and you can be stingy. You go in the fridge and you drink out the Coke. I mean, probably that's greediness in some places. That you see someone in tears and you drink out all the water. You know someone is uh, in need of some support and you turn your back on them. But sure, that's a different level. That's a whole different level by, uh, on its own. That's the type where you wish people don't have something or whatever they possess. It's taken away from them and given to you. And you wish that they will never get it again. This is the worst. This is why Allah Rabbi Al Isa, he uses this in Quran. And he says, He says that these people, they did not have this quality in their hearts. They were given. They were given. Generous. They were filled with generosity. They were filled with sacrificing what they had. Allah says, And whosoever is protected from this degree of stinginess in their soul, Allah says, Then these are those who will be from amongst the successful people on the day of Qiyamah. He says, Come to success 
The adhan will give you success. The thing which you are coming towards, the adhan is calling you for something. What's the, what's the call? What's the adhan? What does the adhan call you to? To come and have a meeting in the masjid? Well, okay, my friend will be there, so I'll meet him and we'll have some chit chats. And you know, well, it's a good meeting place, you know. We can have an, and sit down and play some football and some cricket and. No. Hayyala salah, hayyala salah. Come to salah, come to salah. Then the mu'adhan says, Hayyala al falah. That salah will give you success. So Allah, Allah Rabbul Azza, says that whosoever does not have this quality in their heart, فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِهُونَ These are those people who will be successful on the day of Qiyamah. So Allah protects, or Allah protected the hearts of the Ansar from stinginess of the soul. And this type of sentence, a shah. So these verses, they are speaking about the brotherhood in general. They are, of, of course, they are, it's specifically speaking about the Ansar and the Muhajir. So it's speaking about brotherhood in general, but this was specifically uh, revealed because of the Muhajir and the Ansar between the, uh, that. And as Suhaili, the famous uh, scholar, he says that some people say that this pact of brotherhood, it began five months before the Hijrah. Five months before the Hijrah. Because remember, the Muslims of, who accepted Islam, they used to still come on the Hajj. And they used to meet the Muslims of Makkah. And then they will go back, uh, they will do some da'wah, and then they will come back the next year with more Muslims. And then more Muslims will accept Islam in Makkah. And then they will meet. So this is what Suhaili he says that it began five months before the Hijrah. While other scholars say that it began nine months before the Hijrah. While some scholars they say that as soon as the Prophet ﷺ built al masjid al Nabawi, then the brotherhood began. So we are speaking about something immediate. We are not speaking about something two, three years down the road, you know, it occurred. Something immediate. I mean, what did this brotherhood entail? Was it just, okay, well, he's my Muslim brother and that's it? Was, it, was that the case? No. They were brothers just like blood brothers. When they became Muslim, they became brothers just like blood brothers. So it wasn't like, oh, well, you are from Makkah and we are from Medina, and you know what I mean? Oh, well, you are like this and we are like that. Meaning, even in inheritance, the rules of inheritance would apply to them just as if they were blood brothers. And I'll give you an example of that between the Muhajir and the Ansar. Saad bin Rabia, radiallahu ta'ala, and and Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala Abdurrahman ibn Awf he was a muhajir from Makkah Sa'ad bin Rabia radiallahu ta'ala he was from Medina these two were made brothers to each other the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he paired them off so you are brother to him so when Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala he entered the home of Sa'ad bin Rabia radiallahu ta'ala and Saad bin Rabia, he told, he told Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he said, Oh my brother, I am one of the wealthiest men in Medina. I will split my wealth in half and give it to you. And I'm married to two women. You can take a look at both of them and choose whichever is pleasing to you. I'll divorce her, and after she finishes her idda, you can marry her. I mean, this is the level of sacrifice they were willing to go to. This was the level of sacrifice. I'll give you half of my wealth, and I'm married to two women, you know what I mean? See what she's pleasing to your eyes, and I'll divorce her, and after that you can marry her. I mean, what was the state of these people thinking? I mean, even the wealth part, not the wives. Even the wealth part. I mean, today when Muslims are asked to contribute to something worthwhile, they chinks. 
they give very small amount. And I mean, Muslims, they have, some Muslims are very wealthy. And when they are asked to contribute to something, they are the first people to cry. I mean, this is not something I will dust or sweep under the carpet. This is just the way it is. And people are asked to contribute to something, Muslims. I mean, to the masjid. Why do we have to constantly be begging people to give to the masjid? Why it is we always have to be begging? I'm not going to use the word ask. I'm going to use the word beg. Because this is just how it is. The authorities in the masjid constantly be ha have to be asking, brothers, we have bills to pay, we have this to see about, we have that to see about, brothers, please contribute. My dear respected Muslims, Allah has given us an opportunity. Do not let this opportunity pass by. Otherwise, they may never come back to you. Allah has given us an opportunity to gain some rewards. Do not allow these things to pass by. But shaitan comes in our minds and says, you know, if you give, you have, and you wanted to buy that? And you wanted to buy that thing? How are you going to pay for that? What if you give? Hmm? To care you get poor? This is, this is what Allah, shaitan comes to you. He makes you feel by you giving, you will become poor. It's, uh, the word shaitan itself comes from shata. Shata, the, the word. So shaitan is a derivative from the verb shata. And shata means to deceive. This is why shaitan is the greatest of deceivers. So he deceives you, he befools you to think that when you give, you will become poor. This is what he makes us think. So people have to be constantly begging. People have to be constantly asking. Who, take, who, who is supposed to take care of the needs of the needy and the poor in the community? Whose responsibility is that? Allah will hold us responsible for that on the day of Qiyamah. It's a very, very, very serious thing. Very serious issue. Inshallah, let's stop there because... We are going into some incidents that are kind of lengthy about these, you know, uh, between when the Prophet peered off the Sahabas, incidents that occurred between them.